That was kind, that was kind. <laughs> that was so kind. Thank you, Rosemary. And uh, like I said at Mass, it's just a great joy uh, to be back in Denver to see a lot of old friends. Um, but more importantly, to be to participate in, in this, these days uh, as a student. But um, I know I have to do a little bit of work, but I'm here really to learn as well because we're forever learning. And um, as Rosemary mentioned, um, she was teaching in a, at St. James, and um, you know she uh, was teaching. I think sixth grade. Yeah. And we uh, this school was one of the schools. Archbishop Chapu was the archbishop at the time, and and Our Lady of Lourdes was one of a number of schools that were really struggling and running deficit budgets every year. Um, and every bishop has them. I've got them. Uh, you know, every bishop has schools like this uh, that try to keep them running, try to keep them going. And as you know, uh, many, many, many have closed. And um, we were at a senior staff meeting. I don't know if Rosemary knows this, but we were at a senior staff meeting and um, uh, we were talking about what's the future of Our Lady of Lourdes. And, uh, and, and he, he was said, we just have to, you know, we're just bleeding too much. We have to. And I said, well, I know a teacher that, you know, She's never had any experience as a principal, but she's got a great heart and lots of energy, and she's got a great understanding of Catholic education. Why don't we take, uh, why don't you appoint her principal of this school? I mean, what, what, okay, she crashes and the year is closed. You know, that's, we'll just find out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and Archbishop Shapu, one thing about him, he likes risks. And he's, a risk, he, he's willing to take risks if the, if the idea is good. And I, and I kind of, I said a lot more than that about Rosemary, but I don't want to let her head get all big or anything about it. <laughs> but he said, okay, we'll try it. We'll see what happens. And so at the time, I, maybe she still is, but she was the youngest principal. Are you still the youngest? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. That's, that's, what, that's what being a principal will do. But, um, and so, um, you know, the first year was kind of, up and down a little bit, but slowly then things started to take off, and um, she, uh, you know, the word got out, and she did a lot of, um, you know, PR work herself, and um, the word got around, and this understanding of a classical style of, of education uh, kind of gained uh, interest with people, and um, and and, it, and here we are today, and um, so these kinds of things are happening all across the country. And um, so it's a great joy for me to come back to Denver um, for these days and to participate in, in what we're, we're having here over these next few days. Um, Andrew Seeley is, relative, is a relatively new friend of mine, um, although we have many mutual friends uh, way, going way back. Um, but I'd only seen his name and, and emailed him back and forth until I think we first met at Benedictine College, right, at this past spring, uh, at this new evangelization conference that I was at. Um, but I knew about his work, um, and I um, knew the great things that the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education was doing. Um, and let me just say at the outset um, that I'm more and more convinced that his work and the work of the Institute is poised to play a critical role in revitalizing and renewing Catholic education in our country. And I think just in the last couple of years, we see its growth You know, now with a, a full-time executive director and um, others that, um, you know, that are they're now kind of uh, joining in the work. So, um, and I'm grateful for all of you uh, who have come to Denver. Now, it doesn't take much to convince me to come to Denver. I, I come to Denver whenever I can. Um, but, you know, I know that all of you are, are busy, especially you teachers and administrators um, who have given up a portion of your summer, your summer break, to be here. Um, because I know that the summer break already feels too short, <laughs> right? Yes. Because those, it seems like every year the first day of school gets earlier and earlier. I don't know. That just seems to me. And the preparation for it gets earlier and earlier. So I know that this is precious time because you're right in the middle of your, your downtime. Um, and it's important um, you know, to take that time away to kind of re-energize and renew your, your own batteries. Um, but 
you're spending some time at this conference, uh, not so much as work, but I hope as leisure in the true sense of the word. You know that great book by Joseph Pieper, Leisure is the Basis of Culture. And it is. And I think the conversations that we have, the beautiful Colorado heat, I mean, the, uh, but it's dry heat, right? Um, but it is. It's, it's, it's a it, and it's going to cool off nicely tonight, as it always does. And the stars will be right above us. I think these clouds will probably disappear. And, um, but these are the kinds of experiences that I think do renew us. And I hope that you're here not... I, I, in fact, I, I'm convinced you're probably here because you want to be here, because you really see this as an important part of your own formation. Like I was saying at Mass, you know, we have our own formation. If we want to, to be good teachers and instruments in the hands of the Lord, then we have to have a, 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 an intimate friendship with Jesus, who is the master teacher, and then we are just mere instruments in his hands. And so uh, experiences like this help to renew that love of teaching, we talk about the love of learning, but also the love of teaching. And you wouldn't be teachers unless you felt called to participate in this great enterprise of Catholic education. Uh, and I hope that you're gonna make new friends, new connections, strengthen old friendships, um, and continue to build this wonderful community of, of Catholic educators. Pope Benedict once said that the dignity of education lies in fostering the true perfection and happiness of those to be educated. Let me quote that again. The dignity of education lies in fostering the true perfection and happiness of those to be educated. Perfection and happiness. You know, that's really what we're after. Both in ourselves and also those who we teach. And I'm privileged to be here in the company of those who believe this and who have committed their lives to it. So, thank you again um, for coming. The title of my talk is, uh, Seth, I'm going to put this back just a little bit because I can't see my notes. <laughs> All right, how's that? Is that okay? Okay, the title of my talk this evening is Wonder and the Silence of Learning. Wonder and the Silence of Learning. But before I speak about that theme in a specific way, I'd like to, to look back for a moment on some important historical background that might help us might help us understand how we got here in 2017 and the state of Catholic education in our country. 50 years ago this month in July of 1967 a group of Catholic University presidents and administrators along with Catholic bishops and other officials met together at a retreat center in Land Lakes, Wisconsin, in Wisconsin's northern forest along the border with the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Now, the, when I see Land Lakes, I think of butter. <laughs> but it's, it's the area where the butter comes from. But they chose this place where 26 bishops and mostly Catholic University presidents invited by Father Theodore Hesburgh, then the president of the University of Notre Dame, gathered to discuss the future of Catholic education, higher education, in the United States. In fact, their gathering represented the North American summit for the International Federation of Catholic Universities, which was working in partnership with the Holy See to develop a vision for Catholic higher education that responded to the teachings of the just concluded Second Vatican Council, particularly her, docu her document on Catholic edu education, Gravissimum Educationis. What happened at Lando Lakes is well known to many of you. In the decades prior to 1967, a movement to distance Catholic higher education from the church had been bubbling up in many Catholic colleges and universities across the country. Universities had begun to separate themselves from their sponsoring dioceses and their sponsoring religious institutions, mostly religious institutions of women. Universities 
and theological faculties increasingly stepped out from a Catholic Orthodox position. And Catholics in those decades, before 1967, were playing an increasingly prominent role in American public life, particularly with the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. And they were becoming, little by little, more ide identifiably American and less identifiably Catholic. In certain circles, Catholic intellectuals and academics were becoming more eager to be identified as sophisticated members of the academic world and to play down those elements of faith which were out of step with the prevailing American culture. The Land of Lakes, the Land of Lakes gathering was the culmination of that movement. On July 23rd of 1967, the administrators, bishops, and university presidents, presidents get, gathered together and signed a statement on the nature of the contemporary Catholic university. In their statement, they committed their universities to, quote, contemporary and experimental liturgy, to avoid theological or philosophical imperialism in favor of creative dialogue, and to true autonomy and academic freedom in the face of authority of whatever kind, lay or clerical, external to the academic community itself. That was part of the statement that they issued. In short, the Land O'Lakes statement declared that Catholic universities would become independent from the hierarchy of the church, from any obligation to orthodoxy or to the authentic spirituality of the church. In fact, it did more than that. Land O'Lakes proposed that Catholic universities ought to function as the church's critical reflective intelligence claiming objectively to evaluate the church's life and ministry apart from the lens of faith in order to give the church the benefit of continual counsel. It bemoaned that Catholic universities were not more often asking how the bishops should best undertake their ministry. So the document, you read the document and, and, and there's such, uh, you know, such an air of, of superiority in the document. It's just, it's astounding. The Land O'Lakes statement proposed to redefine the mission of the Catholic University. It rejected the authority of the church and her doctrinal teaching. It declared that it was more important to be accepted according to the standards of the secular universities and academia and secular culture than to authentically live the mission of Catholic education. It was a statement of bold self-importance and self-assertion. The historian Philip Gleason called the Land O'Lakes statement a, a declaration of independence from the hierarchy. We just celebrated the declaration of independence in our country. But in biblical language, we might use a different term. The Land O'Lakes statement was the non servium moment for many Catholic, American Catholic universities. To be sure, not all Catholic universities embraced the Land O'Lakes statement. Many remained faithful to the mission of the gospel. And many have since undergone profound and authentic renewal in faith and mission. At the same time, the Holy See, beginning with the 1983 Code of Canon Law, and especially the 1990 promulgation of the Apostolic Constitution, Ex Corde Ecclesia, from the heart of the church by St. John Paul II has clearly asserted the essential elements of Catholic identity at the core of Catholic higher education. But without a doubt, the Land O'Lakes statement changed the face of Catholic universities in America. And we are only just now beginning to recover, and I think we really are, recovering from the effects of that statement. Now, I realize that this is not a gathering of Catholic University administrators. I know that. This is a gathering of teachers and administrators and principals who are committed to recovering the best liberal and classical traditions of Catholic education, elementary and secondary. We're gathered because we believe education exists 
to form the whole human person. Not just to prepare someone for a career, but to live freely and beautifully as God intended them to be. We believe that education frees us for the purpose of life itself, including virtue, honing reason, and fostering wonder. But we have to realize that higher education has a profound influence on education at the elementary and secondary levels because higher education shapes and forms the philosophy and vision of education in our country and shapes and forms those who run our schools in the graduate schools of education throughout our country, most of whom, most of places are, are secular universities. So I begin with this little historical look back, um, the Land O'Lakes Statement, because it offers us, I think, three points of, re of reflection. One, the first is that it reminds us of the impact that education has on our culture. The rejection of authentically Catholic identity at the university level has impacted every single facet of Catholic life in the United States and every single stage of American Catholic education from kindergarten on up. One year after the Land O'Lakes Statement, Humanae Vitae was issued and faculty members from Catholic colleges and universities across America, especially the Catholic University of America in Washington, led an organized and public dissent against that papal encyclical, sowing mass confusion among Catholics. By the way, John Garvey, uh, who is the president of Catholic University of America, attended this convocation of Catholic leaders that I just came from today in Orlando, Florida, and we had a great conversation. John Garvey is a great man, and his sister lives here in Denver, Annette, and uh, her son's a priest, and, um, and John come, came back here often while I was here, and we've become good friends, and he's doing wonderful things at Catholic University, but he was telling me that they're planning uh, an anniversary uh, conference at Catholic University on Humanae Vitae next year, a big one, um, 50 years after that encyclical, that kind of watershed encyclical. At the same time that this happened in 1967, liturgical life on Catholic college campuses began to decline. Priests and religious began to disappear from college campuses. Campus sexual promiscuity became more and more tolerated. Tuition began to climb. And gradually, Catholic colleges and universities began to resemble with hardly any distinction, their secular counterparts. The loss of the Catholic University as a reliable and faithful secular, a reliable and faithful place for formation <coughs> left more than one generation of Catholic adults unformed, spiritually, intellectually, <coughs> and personally, to live according to the Catholic faith. What had once been our great facilitators of Catholic culture now ushered in an era of diminished religious practice, wholesale lack of catechesis, and sacred liturgy bereft of beauty. Lando Lakes sought to make many parts of the Catholic University indistinguishable from their secular counterparts. That was the goal. And that has impacted the entire church in the United States. In 1960, 4.5 million students attended Catholic schools in the United States. Today, the number is less than two million. Now, there are a lot of factors which contribute to that decline. But the decline of the Catholic University is a training ground for dynamic and faithful Catholic educators, teachers, and administrators, and as a context in which to discern and discover vocations, has a great deal to do with the diminished place of Catholic education in the United States. In the 50 years since the Land O'Lake Statement, Secularization of Catholic universities has led, secularization in many, led to secularization in many Catholic elementary and high schools, to textbooks which do not reflect Catholic perspectives, and teachers who have regrettably and many times through no fault of their own have not been trained to think and teach from the heart and wisdom of the church. But here's the good news. 
if dissenting universities actively distancing themselves from Catholic identity can have an impact that, prof that, that profound on Catholic and civic culture, then faithful schools, alive to the best traditions and wisdom of the church and dedicated to the formation of disciples, can be an unparalleled instrument for the revitalization of Catholic culture. And I'm firmly convinced of that. If you want authentically Catholic culture, you need authentically Catholic schools. And this past 50 years has taught us that. The work that you are doing, creating authentically Catholic schools, will without question significantly impact the culture in the United States in the next 50 years. The Lord is using your work for his purposes. So thank you for cooperating with his grace. Monday meeting, Monday evening, just a little aside, Monday evening at, down in Orlando, I had a meeting with, real, real good meeting with Curtis Martin, the founder of Focus, and Don Briel, who is the founder of Catholic Studies Institute at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. He's sort of the father of Catholic Studies programs. Um, and uh, Monsignor Jim Shea, who's the president of University of Mary in Bismarck. We've entered into a relationship with the University of Bismarck to offer uh, graduate degrees in educational administration. We have a number of priests that are enrolled. We have the blessing in the Diocese of Lincoln that, that all of our administrators are priests for all of our 26 elementary schools and six high schools. And so we have the, we have the, I have the responsibility of making sure that they are degreed with master's levels and PhDs in educational administration. And it's hard to find places that grant those degrees that are reliable and trustworthy. But University of Mary has a wonderful program in graduate level education degrees. And so we've entered into a relationship with them and they have a distance learning component, which helps because all of our priests are, are involved in parish work as well. But we had this meeting about Catholic Studies Institutes in campuses where there are already very vibrant Newman centers and where focus is present. You know, 90% of all college-age Catholic students are at public universities, and only 10% are at Catholic universities. So that tells me that we need to put resources, energy, and time into developing these places where, where, the, where Catholic students lose their faith, really, oftentimes. And I won't go through those statistics, but FOCUS is doing a great job to stem that tide, but one of the things that FOCUS doesn't offer is an intellectual formation. They just can't do everything. They got the charisma, they, they have the wonderful Bible studies, and they bring kids back to the church and convert them. But the intellectual formation that's part of our patrimony and our, and our heritage is, is just not there. And so we started at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and the Newman Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture which uh, is offering undergraduate courses um, for credit through our seminary, St. Gregory the Great Seminary, which are transferred, are transferred credits to the degrees at the university so that students can take their transcript to the registrar and transfer. They, they, they partner with 70 different institutions, including their, our seminary, so that they can take these courses no matter what their degrees are. Ag science is a big degree at the University of Nebraska. So they can have their ag science degrees but also take these wonderful courses in the great books. Um, we hired Dr. John Free, hired him away from Wyoming Catholic College. He was a tenured professor at Hillsdale, and he's the director, the new director of our, this past year, the new director of our institute. I say that because we, I talked, we, the meeting we had on Monday was how can we replicate this on college campuses across the country? Just like focus sort of spread like a prairie fire in Nebraska. So we would like to see these institutes which could eventually even grant degrees in education and in formation to students who are education majors um, and you know, to really transform uh, and, and offer a place for, for those who, who are called to teach to be formed. That's just a little sidebar. Um, so, um, I lost my place here. Okay, so the work that you're doing 
is very important. That's one of the points I wanted to make. And it will impact the culture. In your communities, I've met people from Arizona and from Louisiana and from, you know, back east and, you know, all over the country we have people uh, representing schools, Catholic schools, academies, different kinds of schools, different styles. I mean, we're very diverse, you know, we're into diversity and I think it's wonderful to see the different kinds and styles of schools. We have to be open to these things, you know. Um, back to the future, I always say, you know, and it's, a, it's, 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 it's wonderful to see the different models of schools and, um, and we have to be open to different kinds of models because one, sh one size doesn't fit all. My second point, first point was that you are having an impact on our culture. The second point for reflection is that all Catholic educators face a, temp a temptation that we must be prepared for. The Land O'Lakes statement was born of a temptation to measure the credibility, effectiveness, impact and importance of Catholic universities according to the standards of the world. To confuse influence, sophistication, or social acceptance with virtue and fidelity. To chase after the faddish trends of the moment instead of being grounded in perennial truth. The wise man builds his house upon rock, the Lord tells us. So does the wise teacher and the wise administrator. We need to be careful to ensure that our schools and classrooms are grounded in an authentic Christian anthropology and an authentically Catholic metaphysics and epistemology and an authentic commitment to the perfection of the human person through the renewal of the mind, the will, and most importantly, the imagination through Jesus Christ. And I'll, my, if you're sticking around for my talk on Friday night, I'll be talking about the importance of the renewal of the imagination. To me, that's the most crucial work we have ahead of us. At the same time, we cannot askew all that is new or modern or useful simply because it's novelty. We need to be intentional and discern carefully between the genuinely problematic and the merely unfamiliar. This is especially true in the area of technology. And I'm so happy that Sister Mary is here. There she is, who uh, oversees our uh, technology initiative in the Diocese of Lincoln. Um, we've been blessed with a wonderful benefactor um, and many people who support this. We can't implement take technology unreflectively. And we, she has her assistant here, too, as well, a new hire to, to do just that. We can't implement technology unreflectively simply because it has become faddish or the expectation of parents and the educational system. But we can't eschew technology unreflectively either. Instead, we need to become creative enough to make use of technology in a matter that supports the liberal aims of education and respects the dignity of the human person. Meaningfully, meaningfully engaging with modernity is much more difficult than either capitulating to it or rejecting it out of hand. But that difficulty is among the most important challenges for Catholic liberal education in the 21st century. My third point. My third point and my most fundamental point and key point is that the Land O'Lakes statement reminds us of the importance of humility, docility, wonder, and receptivity in education. The Land O'Lakes statement was self-assertive and self-important. Look it up and read it. It's just written all over the pages. And that defies an authentically Catholic view of education. Good students and good teachers seek to know things as they are, to know and understand the really real, as my godfather and teacher John Sr. used to say, to get in touch with the really real. He was a realist. To know the Lord and to see the world in the light of divine truth. True schools are communities of learners and faculties of friends receiving and apprehending reality together, not asserting themselves or their importance, 
True communities of learners are humble disciples of the truth. Pope St. John Paul II wrote, quote, that faced with the sacredness of life and the human person and before the marvels of the universe, wonder is the only appropriate attitude. Let me repeat that. Faced with the sacredness of life and the human person and before the marvels of the universe, the marvels of the Rocky Mountains and the beautiful Colorado sunset, wonder is the only appropriate attitude that we must have. Wonder is humility before the majesty of God. Wonder tolerates no self-importance. Wonder forgets self. Wonder seeks only to gaze at the marvelous beauty of the world and its creator. In 2008, Pope Benedict XVI told American educators at Catholic University of America that, quote, every Catholic educational institution is a place to encounter the living God who in Jesus Christ reveals his transforming love and truth. Encountering the living God is at the heart of true and meaningful Catholic education. If we're not about that, we might as well just forget it. This means that teachers and administrators must first themselves be disciples of Jesus Christ. It means that prayer, silent communion with the Eucharistic Lord, is at the center of the vocation of a teacher, a Catholic teacher. To effectively foster encounters with the living God, each one of you must cultivate a deep and abiding interior relationship with the Lord, especially in the silence of prayer. The Lord's first language, St. John of the Cross tells us, is silence. And we need to learn that language. All missionary activity, which seeks to foster encounter with the Lord, must begin in silence, in lives of intimate prayer before the Lord. This is especially true in education, where fostering an attitude of receptivity and humility and wonder is at the heart of your mission. If we want to cultivate an authentically Catholic and liberal school, which frees us, liberates us to know the Lord, we need to cultivate a spirituality of silence, which is the sign of discipleship, listening to the Master, most especially silence before the Lord in adoration of the Holy Eucharist. And this is where I make my shameless plug of my new pastoral letter called Love Made Visible a pastoral letter on adoration of the Most Holy Eucharist, and it's free for your taking. <laughs> Communion with Jesus in the presence of the Eucharist requires that we look at him and acknowledge the mystery of his presence, that we learn to appreciate what it really means to be looked upon by him who loves us more than anyone else in the universe. We each desire to be known by another, and adoration of the Lord at the heart is the experience of being seen, known, and cherished, not simply by another, but by our very Creator. The silence and openness, the concentration and presence that the Lord asks of us when we come before Him isn't easy, but it's transformative. A teacher who sits in silence before the Blessed Sacrament in humility is transformed by the Lord and made fit to foster authentic transformation of students, transformation in the wonder and the silence of learning. Fifty years ago, a Declaration of Independence in Catholic education transformed our culture. Today, may your Declaration of Humility, Wonder, and utter dependence on the grace of God, transform your schools, transform the church, and transform human hearts in the love of Jesus Christ. I close with the encouragement of Pope Benedict XVI to all teachers. May each one of you bear witness to hope, nourish your witness with prayer, account for the hope that characterizes your lives by living the truth which you propose to your students. Help them to know and love the one you have encountered, whose truth and goodness you have experienced with joy.
Thank you very much.